and and so some of what we want to talk about tonight is in this culture with phones with media like it is how can we pull away and accomplish i appreciated what you said at the beginning our number one calling in my opinion is our marriage and number two ministry and calling is our kids raising up that next generation i would even go so far to say many of the things we see going on in the world today are the result of a generational gap where parents and i'll say it like this sometimes we assume if i'm a christian and i go to church somewhere my kids will be all right and we don't take on that role of parenting as seriously as we could have and then there we wake up and they're 20 and there's a lot of regret and so i appreciate that you're here because it says that's not what you want and uh what a blessing what a blessing we were just uh encouraged sitting out in the truck earlier just that your heart is for your families it's it's so powerful um about you know I, i'm going to talk a little bit more about that you know dara now I, the Truthfully, I don't do social media, and I, I never actually have just because I never wanted it. But Dara tells me, and maybe she should speak about this, you know, there's just constant information coming at us from social media, from all these apps on our phone. And, 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 and we're going to talk more about that a little later. I think it's misleading us about what our life is about. And I know... I tell my kids all the time, which their age is 33 to 20, um, you know, that thing is lying to you, actually. And be very careful. We're, we're grateful for our phones and, and the benefits that we have. But just want to mention that, uh, you know, the, the whole, uh, what, what app was it you were telling me about? App? Yeah, one that tells you, like, you need a new kitchen or something like oh. that. Okay, so Dennis doesn't know what any yeah. of the social media apps are. He and and I got off social media in the fall of 2020, so I haven't really been on social media for a long time. Well, it's not a long time, but it it's been a while since I've I've not scrolled a feed in in like almost three years. Um, and there's been just like a huge amount of fruit that I wish I had time to tell you about because it's beautiful what yeah. the Lord has done in my heart as a result of getting off social media. But if we scroll our social media feeds, we could very easily decide we need to remodel our bathroom. Something uh, shows you a picture of a nice one, right? Didn't yeah, you tell me that? or we need to start this new exercise program. Or we need to start being worried about the lipine and the tomatoes. And we ought to impregnate ourselves with a frozen embryo so that we can release Gideon's army. Which these are good things. I mean, there's just so many things that you could take on. And what happens is God has a to-do list for us. Hmm. And it's his to-do list. And when Jesus did God's to-do list at the end of three years... After redeeming all of mankind, past, present, and future, he was able to say, I have completed what you have given me to do. And on the cross, he said, it is finished. But how many of us get to the end of the day and go, oh my gosh, I'm so busy, busy, busy. And I just don't have enough time to do all the things I need to do. Yeah. That is not God's to-do list. Yeah. He would not have us feel this way at the end of the day. So what happens is with social media is we take on our friends' to-do list. We take on our own personal to-do list, yeah. and we're not living by God's to-do list. Yeah, and we weren't asked to speak tonight about social media, <laughs> but, but it's, a significant, <laughs> it's a significant reality in what Dara and I are experiencing in our own fellowship and the families. We do parenting classes is the difficulty it is to sometimes lay that down and take care of the more significant things and so that's why i mention it uh you know dara t is going to tell a story here in a minute but you know uh, uh we think all these wonderful inventions are helping us right and they're supposed to make our lives so much easier tell the story you were telling me about so there's a lie that the enemy tells us and is it and it's that i don't have enough time to do all the things that i need to do in a day 
and about, let's see, maybe 75 years ago, there was a World's Fair. And at that World's Fair, there were a lot of modern, time-saving inventions that were put on display. And the big push in the advertisement was that if you'll buy these conveniences that are just around the corner, you're going to have time to do the important things in life. You're going to have time to invest in your marriage. You're going to have time to really spend time with your kids. You're going to have, you're just going to have all the time in the world. And so they've calculated present day time saving conveniences in the way of the internet, computers, uh, kitchen appliances, all, all the works. We literally in 2023 live in an age that we have the equivalent of 50 manservants at our disposal. We have 50, the equivalent of 50 people doing the work that a person had to do back in the day but yet we have less time than we've ever had before. So it's not working. It's not, because it's a heart problem. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and that's why we wanted to mention it to you. There has to be where we at least identify the reality, not to say, again, we're, we're not bashing social media, those sort of things, but we do want to encourage you to pay attention, to look at where your time's going, because. You're here because you want to raise godly kids, you know. And, and what are those things that are stressing us out and overwhelming us and we're trying to do our kids? And so we wanted to start by just mentioning it. Another thing I want to uh, just throw out here, um, we as followers of Christ, this is, I just got a few comments and then we're going to, we actually have six tools we want to give you tonight. So that's going to be awesome. I should have come up with seven. It's a more spiritual number. Maybe I'll think of one here in a minute, but uh, we have six tools we're going to go over. But, but just a couple of things I wanted to say. Today, we are so inundated with how the culture is defining for us family, how to raise your kids, what lifestyle we lead. I mean, it, 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 how important our cell phone is. I mean, culture... I tell everybody it's like right now, and, and we'll say it's not in this room because this one's sacred, but if you walk out those doors right there, it's like the airwaves are saying cultural uh, uh, phrases to me. Like, and I could name a bunch of them, and, and I actually did this in our church not long ago. We had, I was just trying to say a few of them, but I want to call your attention to it and, and ask you to be thinking about this. Ask the Lord over the next weeks. Lord, would you show me? Just show me. Because he, you know, he's, it's not about condemnation or any of that, but show me where our family thinks more like culture than the Bible. Thinks more like culture than the kingdom. I actually, you know, and, and I don't want to get off on other subjects, but there were some people wanting to talk to me about, oh no, what if everything goes bad in the world? How do we prepare? How do we prepare? So I really spent some time seeking the Lord about that. And this is what the Lord said to me as the preparation. That we, the body of Christ, need to take the time to allow the Lord to show us where we live and believe more like culture than the kingdom. Yeah. It's very, very important. So I just wanted to mention that to you because it's, it's everywhere. I mean, every commercial I see is telling me how I have all the rights in the world and I deserve now. And as a matter of fact, that commercial can't believe I don't already have it. So hurry and get it. That is not the biblical paradigm, but it's just hitting us all day long. And then we get in our marriage and, and or, or raising our kids and something's not happening now. And we're ready to give up and go find something new. And so that's how it's just secretively kind of hidden, just attacking us. So I want to mention, I'm going to read a Bible verse for you just because I love this Bible verse. Because it's, it's not tip number, we'll make this tip number seven. We'll go with tip number seven first. Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four through nine. You probably know these verses are very, very familiar. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These words, this love the Lord your God, 
with all your everything, which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Okay, so, and then let me, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And so I remember when we had young kids and, and all through, I would be, you know, we'd be sitting around the house and what are we going to talk about? And so believe it or not, I would literally just do this verse. I would say, you know what? We're going to love the Lord. All these, all these, we're going to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul. Do y'all know what that means? What would that look like? And, and so just conversate constantly on how much your family loves God. And we're going to love him with all our hearts. So when things come up that we really like, which there's a lot of those, we're going to have the opportunity to say it again. I mean, that's what this verse directly says all the time talk about it all the time when you get up in the morning when you go to bed at night when you're walking through the house when you're walking through the store when you're getting home from the store and so that's as practical as I know how to get with it so make your language talking about how much your family loves God and then let mom say mom don't you love God yeah I love God too Everybody in the, in, the, in the car, raise your hand if you really love God with all your heart. You know, and you're the cheerleader doing that. So, anyway, well, one note, I think uh, there, I'll, I'll just say it real quick. Uh, the things we say, and, and, and it truly is our heart. I tell our church this all the time. Uh, we are not in any way shooting for perfection. I don't believe that exists. And so, we want to share these tools as an encouragement to you. Not as a, you hadn't been doing this and you're in really trouble and it's, you know, it's not going to turn out well. That's not our heart at all. So I just want to say that. And, uh, I love, uh, but, but here's what we are doing though. Ephesians chapter four, verse 13 says something like this, that the Lord gave us all these gifts and, the, and these callings in the church, but they're to equip the saints, which are all of us to do the work of the ministry until. And that until is till every person in the room and your children reach the fullness of the stat statue, which is a measure of Christ. Maturity in Christ. That's what we're after. You know, what do I want for my kids? I want them to mature in Christ. What do I want for me? I want to reach the measure of the statue, which is in the fullness of Christ. So anyway, just an encouragement. Darrell, you start off here with practical tip number one come on okay. are we there yet nope yep we are good okay Let's see practical tool number one uh, we like to start off our marriage and our parenting classes by encouraging the people to consider something that we would just automatically do for our business if we were starting a business which is is a good thing it's an important thing but maybe not an eternal thing. We would also consider doing what I'm about to tell you about if we were gonna start a ministry. Yeah. And ministry has eternal aspects to it, of course, but it's to write a vision. Yeah. You know, the, the Bible says that without a vision, the people uh, perish. Another version says that they cast off restraint um, and, and to me, the picture is that they, they have no boundaries. They have nothing holding them to the path. They have nothing holding their feet to the fire. They don't have that bigger yes in their heart. So they say yes to everything. Yeah. And they're not really able to accomplish what the Lord has called them to do because they don't really have a vision. Yeah. And yeah. so well, go ahead. I'll just jump in there. So I don't know. How many of y'all actually have a vision, a family vision? Of what you want your family to be written out right now. Yeah. And I'm going to say this. Y'all are identical to every class we've ever taught. We've never had we've anyone. never had a couple. Unless it was a repeat student. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, we required. No. Uh, and so think about it for a minute. What Dara was just saying. 
If you if you go to work, you expect them to give you a a, a job. A, what's it called? Description. Description. That's a vision for what you're going to be doing and what you're going to devote your time what's to. What's expected of you? If you had, go to a ministry and you're trying to check this church out, what do you want to read? You want to read their vision statement or their mission statement. Their values. Because it's the direction they're going, and every parent has a has something in their mind. You know, I, I know. I think I know where I want to go. But if you want to stay on track, and again, tying into what I was saying earlier about all the information, all the advertisements, all the things that are just taking from us energy and, you know, we're overwhelmed without a vision. It's Proverbs, what is it? Proverbs 29, 18. We perish. And, and we prefer, and, and that's what Dara mentioned, the, the uh, translation says, without a vision, we cast off restraint. Because this is how it practically happens. If you have your vision and it's written out, and we advise you, right? We had one couple, they made a big banner and put it on the wall. It was beautiful. And we actually advised that. They framed it and put it over their dining room table. And in the center was the, the most important thing about their vision. And then on the side, they listed kind of like the core values of their yeah. family. Yeah. So it was beautiful. Because constantly we're asked to do things and you know well I'm supposed to do this with my kids we want to we want to have this family time this couch time or we want and something comes up and without a vision we cast off the restraint so that we accomplish our vision and we say yes and all of a sudden we're like oh man I'm sorry I missed that will you forgive me and all over time as we don't have that vision that just continues and continues and continues. And again, we may end up with regret later. So we want to ask y'all, tool number one, to go home. And over the next weeks, we always encourage, you know, our marriages, this is like go out on a date, you know, find a babysitter, go out on a date and literally sit down and say, what are we, what are we building here? And write it out. Write, write it as detailed or as non-detailed as you want to write it. Um, mm -hmm. it. It's not your law. I want to say that. Some people are very afraid to put anything yeah. in writing yeah. because they feel like they're held to that and that they won't be able to attain to it and they don't want to feel bad if they fall short. But you just need to put it in writing. You yeah. just need to go ahead and go for it and write it down and just realize that you're going to fall short and that's okay. But as long as you're characterized by shooting for it yeah, and you hit it. the mark like 70% of the time, you're going to accomplish something yeah. according to that vision. Yeah, yeah we, we often say, you know, when you're trying to write this vision, one of the things we did, and, and we've had one, I don't know, maybe 30 or so years, but excuse me, uh, answer this question. What do you want truthfully said about your marriage? So we wrote one for our marriage. We've written one for our family. And they're a lot alike, but it is a little different for our marriage. And then including our children, we have a little a different. And we've, you know, I have one that's like pages long, but we've, we eventually got ours down into one sentence. And, and I'll read that for you. But what do I want true of, of our family in one year? And that can be your vision. What do I want true said of us, truly said of us in five years? And that you write, begin to write it out and pray about it and talk about it together as a couple. And then, then you come up with one and you're like, yeah, you, it's okay if it changes in three years. Well, we, we go through seasons, seasons of life, yeah. so our vision changes as our season changes. Like my vision for my life right now with all adult children who get up and leave and go to work somewhere yeah. else is very different than when I had seven children and I was expected to get up and try to teach them school or whatever, you know, and clean a house and cook a supper and be a pastor's wife and, and all that. So yeah, seasons change. So our visions change. Yeah. Read them our, our little one sentence here, vision statement. Okay. Our one sentence vision statement is the Aldi family vision is that our family would define who God is to the world so that the world can find God. Very simple. Yep. Just wanted to be Christ-like, reflect God in our marriage and in our parenting so that a lost world would get a picture of God and want 
him and want him. And, and so that's the summarized version. But what went all behind that is, so when we're in Walmart and I had seven kids with me, my vision was that when people saw a guy walking down the aisle with seven kids, they went, I want to know who his God is by the way my children were behaving, by the way I was relating to my children, by the way they were relating to one another. And, and so that vision provoked me to take the time at home to build that. And, lots and, and of training. That's, yeah, lots. And, and so that's what we're trying to say there. So we'll move on to the next one because I, I wanna, we want to have a little time for some question and answer at the end. So please be thinking of some questions you have. Um, the next topic that I want to say, I think I'm going to skip that part, is practical tool number two. So number one is write a vision. Seriously, write a vision. Put it on the wall. Read it to your kids. Over, like every three months, family, it's, you're, having, you're having supper. Say, hey, let's all read the family vision. How do you think we're doing? How do you think we're doing? And you and your wife can ask this, but invite the kids into it. Let them be a part of it. It's wonderful. Uh, practical tool number two. Now, this one is a little bit, uh, I almost say hard, but actually it's extremely not. We have got to look at our priorities. So the tool I'm going to ask you to do is go home and talk about your priorities. Because again, in this world where everything's coming against us, uh, you know, our vision is going to help us write our priorities. Uh, the world that's that's constantly saying what our priorities should be, you know, uh, and and we've realized again these are things that we've almost forgotten to think about. I mean, we know them, but do we conversate and and get purposeful about them? So that's why they're real simple. So often our priorities are wrongly placed because we have the wrong identity about ourselves. Does that make sense? So, so today's world, I don't know. How many of you have ever, well, I won't ask that. A lot of people I meet, and they actually come up to Darren and I, and they're like, hey, I'd love to get some time with you, but I just know you're so busy, and, and I know you're so busy, and I always let them say, no, I'm not. And they're, they're like shocked. I've never heard anybody say that before. Yeah. And, and, and I'm like, I have a lot of things to do, but, but my, I'm not a busy person. I have to, I will make time, I, you know. And I say that one because it's almost like with technology and so, like the, the story where 50, 50 servants working for us and we're busier than we ever were before. It is a reality for many of us as parents. You know, there's these little things that's in our heart to do with our kids and to sit down on the floor. But we just have become, we identify ourselves as busy. And I say this in all kindness and humility, almost like that makes us important. Mm -hmm. Like when, when people come up to me and I'm like, yeah, I'm busy. You busy? Yeah, we're busy. Like that's my identity. I don't want that to be my identity. I want my identity to be son of God. You know what I'm saying? And so because I get the right identity, now I can have the right priority. And with my vision, I know what to say yes to, and I know what to say no to. So in your parenting, we want to ask y'all to, you know, we're giving you some homework. Uh, on it, write a vision and sit down and really write out what are your priorities based on that vision. What, what should a priority be? Um, you know, we're talking about when we talk about priorities, we're talking about how do we manage our resources, which are time and money. That's our two biggest resources. How do we manage those? How do we steward those? And again, I know all of us are doing a pretty good job at it, but you'll be amazed that if you take the time to write it out and then look at it and pay attention, all of a sudden it'll even get way better. And that's our heart is just to encourage you to do, do even more than what you are. Not, a, not as a like, you got to do more, but as a, you can do it. Does that make sense? You want to... Yeah. Is that where we are? Yep. Okay. Um, I think I've already shared this. Oh, great. I think we're... We're not a, good with notes. A lot we're, of us, we, we just speak out of our heart, and sometimes we, we're jumping around in our notes. But 
um, I think it's just the idea that we're doing we're doing our own to-do list. Yeah. And we're not even taking the time to go to the Lord and saying, Lord, what do you have for me today? Yeah. Based on priorities, based on vision, yeah. based on the kingdom. We're just kind of an autopilot, just doing. We're in the rat race. We've got to get it done. And we're, and like Dennis said, I, I have so many friends that it's just like, how are you doing? Oh, I'm so busy. I'm just like meeting myself coming and going. You know, we got this done. I'm like busy every night of the week. And, you know, it's just like it really does. And, and it's it, true. And we it's are busy. Okay. Yeah, but if if things are falling, if eternal things are falling through the cracks, yeah, that's good. I think we need to reassess yeah. our priorities. Yeah. If because we don't want to live guilty, we don't want to live with regret. We want to we want to get to the end of our lives and not say things like, "I just wish I would have stopped yeah. and bent down and looked my kids in the eyes," and I wish I would have. St- you know, um, was amazed at the wonder of the pine cone they brought in from the yard. And, you know, I, I just wish I would have enjoyed that with them yeah. instead of going, oh, my word, what are you doing? Get that thing out of here. You know, I mean, we just want to get to the end of our lives and not have regret. And so uh, we just want to give God, it's very prideful. I just want to say this, this kind of ate my lunch. It is a prideful thing to plan your own life. And not give God a chance to order your day and, and tell you what his to-do list is for you. And if you're doing his to-do list, it's, it, you're, can be done. it can be accomplished. Yeah. And it can be accomplished in peace and not frustration and frazzled, uh, a, fra- a frazzled state of mind. Yeah. Um, and I, I just want to step in. We don't want to give you some false reality that we didn't have days of frazzling. You know what I'm saying? But we 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 predominantly, because of, of literally writing a vision, writing priorities, we had way more peace. And and again, seven kids is a lot, but we were able to operate out of peace. So that's why I was saying. So tell us, and and Dara had a conversation. I want you to tell us what. What would you suggest some priorities maybe in order should be? She just did a class in a ladies' Bible study on priorities, yeah. and it was awesome. She yeah. had this demonstration. We wished we could have brought it tonight. But anyway, what would you suggest? Because culture doesn't say this. Yes, and I'm not saying these should be your priorities. I'm telling you what my priorities are and how I've processed through, like, there's this new opportunity that is made available to me. And I need to decide, am I going to say yes to this new opportunity or am I going to say no? And first of all, I need to realize that one of the anchors in my life, one of the non-negotiable priorities is my relationship with the Lord. And so... Which equals a quiet time. Which equals time in the Word and prayer. And, and you know, if you can worship and adore Him too, that's all the better. But... You know, I've just been convicted of picking up my phone, and I'm a doula, and so I have women that are in labor, and so when I wake up in the morning, I just want to make sure nobody's needed me through the night, you know, and so I'm picking up my phone first thing in the morning, and I'm not giving first priority to the Lord, and there's a phrase, and I've kind of adopted this phrase. I love little phrases that you can just kind of get down into your DNA to encourage yourself, but it's the throne before the phone. <laughs> Isn't that great? That's a good one. The throne before the phone. And so I'm really trying to adopt that of yeah. not getting on my phone, checking news, checking messages, checking email, you know, checking, 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 checking until I've given Jesus first priority. Amen. And how prideful is it of me to presume that I could make it through the day and navigate all these things without first going to him and saying, I need you today. So God, my second priority, and we love telling our kids this, and we probably told you this the last time we were here, is that our marriage is our number one earthly relationship. So I would look at our kids and I would say, your daddy's number one and you're number two. And you would think that might hurt their feelings, but it just made their day. I mean, they just thought that was the 
cute, um, not cutest, but they thought it was funny. They was like, they loved it. <laughs> you know, and then he would tell me I was number one and they were number two and they would just giggle. And so we are number one relationship on the earth for each other. And second would be my responsibilities to my children. And I think number four for me would be maybe my home. I believe that God has called me to be a keeper of my home. That doesn't mean that I don't work outside of the home, but it does mean that my home is a priority. It's a place of ministry. It's a place of hospitality. And then one more that I believe um, that would trump the other things in my life was my commitment to the local, not the corporate, but the local body of Christ, my family of God. So if doula work gets in the way of me being available to the Lord to commit to my church family, doula work would go on the altar because the body of Christ is more of a priority to me than working. Now, if you're, if you're the breadwinner, you know, you have to navigate and process that differently. But, um, well, I'll say this, I, 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 one thing I ask a, a church that we, it's our, our church, uh, the one that we're, we're kind of lead there. I asked them one Sunday, this is about five years ago. So let me just ask y'all a random question. Does it matter what church you go to? Does it matter? And, and shockingly, I tried not to take offense. Everybody said, not really. It, it, and it, our culture is telling us that. That, it, you know, well, it's just okay. You know, I, I, I grew up, you went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and you had training union on Tuesday night and visitation on Thursday night. I mean, we were committed. And, and, and you know, we're so busy now that the church, I'm not saying exactly where it's supposed to be on your priority, but I believe you need this body of Christ. If you are going to raise a godly family, you need the people in this room. And I I want to say it unashamedly. You need them in your life. And so anyway, we're going to move on to the next because I want us I want us to get through these. Uh, So that's two. So we're going to write a vision. I want you to really look at your priorities. And, And these are practical things you can go home and do. Put your kids down. Let's talk about priorities. Um, really wrestle over those. A uh, practical tool number three, and this one again, taking thoughts captive. Oh, you know how practical is that? I, I have story after story after story where I believe every nanosecond. If you know what that is, that's a ten to the minus nine second. I had to take thoughts captive and cast them out. And we know the Bible verses, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are, are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Because we are destroying speculations and lofty thoughts in our minds. And I, I, I tell people all the time, I think that's like the day after you become saved, you're given a job description. And the job description is learn how to take your thoughts captive unto the obedience of Christ. And we don't even pay attention to our thoughts. That's why this is very practical. So I'm asking you to begin to say, Lord, I don't don't need another thing to be worried about. But would you show me my thoughts and allow me the opportunity to just go, that's not the Lord. I renounce that. I am not stressed out. So much that I can't love my children and husband today. I am not stressed out so much that I can't love my wife today. I've had a busy day and it was a bad day. All those are real things. But the enemy takes those real circumstances and begins to feed us and inundate us with thoughts that are not true biblically. Because most often they end up that I'm a failure. You know, from I I can't do it, it was a bad day, I didn't take care of this. And we all have those. And that thought, as long as we're listening to it, as long it ends up somehow you're condemned. And your children aren't going to make it. And then we just want to give up completely. So we want to ask you, you have something you want to go ahead. 
There's, there's just a whole host of yeah. lies. There are lies yeah. that we believe about God that separate us from his help. Yeah. You know, there are lies that we believe about ourselves that are rooted in pride that cause him to oppose us and resist us. There are lies that we believe about sin, like as yeah. long as I don't get rid, uh, get caught or I, I can get away with a few little sins. Yeah. And we want to take and then, those thoughts captive um, and say There's no. so many lies. And I think the, the one we wanted to mention most, and this is, this is a huge temptation, and it's that my work at home, discipling my family, loving, investing in my marriage is not as important as the things I do outside of my home. Yeah. And yeah. so uh, that is a lie the enemy wants us to believe so that he can keep us busy and outside of our home. Because for us to really have lasting impact and for us to accomplish the job of passing on our faith and our values to the next generation, it's going to take time yeah. in our home, Lots having conversations, time. eating meals, playing games, snuggling eye to eye. You know, it's just going to take a purposeful, intentional uh, act of our will to go there because nothing in this culture is telling us to do that. I'm going to tell kind of a, a sad story. Uh, we were, were from Mississippi, if you didn't know, uh, and there was a guy that literally had a garage sale one time. A total random stranger comes to our garage sale, and he I don't know how long he was there, but I was in the house, and Dara was out there because I'm just not, I'm like, take it, take it, just whatever, you know, take it. Uh, I just want to get rid of it. Yeah. But uh, he, after a little while, he came to Dara and he just said, can I talk with you? Is your husband around? And she's like, sure. So I came out and he's like, what's the deal with your kids? And we're like, uh, I don't know what's wrong with them. Anyway, uh, long story. He was like, why are they peaceful? Why do they act like they like each other? Why did they obey their mom? And so we, we told him a little bit, well, you know, we love Jesus. And we said a few things. We, we work very diligently to love them and train them. And, and so he, he left, but he, he got our number. And, like, he called me four or five times. And one time, like, I have a daughter. He had three daughters, I think. And, and he was describing chaos and all this. And finally I said, well, let's just get together and talk. And this is a very sad conversation because he, he this finally gets to <laughs> I want to know what you did because I'm real worried about my daughters. You know, they're, one of them was like 13 at this time, I think. And at, at school the other day, some guy came over and, uh, you know, did something inappropriate to her. And, and, and she really liked it, though. She liked it, you know, and, and, and they're considering rebelling and all, and all these things. And I just said, well, tell me about your life. What do you do? And so I listened to this man for about 30 minutes and, and all the things that he loved and all the things he wanted to accomplish. And not once did he mention his family. But he was there to get me to tell him five steps. If he'll do this, he's going to have a family just like mine. I mean, literally, that's what he said to me. I just need you to give me, what can I do? Because I, I want a family like yours. And I answered in this way. I just said, well, to be the truthful, I'm not even going to tell you because I don't believe you will do it. I'm very sad to say that. I said, I love you. I would love for your family to, to grow up in, in, in healthy relationships. But if you're not willing to change that life you just described to me, I don't believe you can have it. And, and I don't want to put that on y'all. And I, I just that's a reality to raise the family that your vision is going to say, you're going to change the way you live. And it, let me tell you, you'll agree with me, I bet, if you don't, raise your hand. It is so worth it. I could sit here, would never do it, but I could list hundreds of thousands of dollars I gave up to be with my family. I could list tons, and my wife the same, tons of golden, godly, great opportunities I said no to because they didn't fit my vision for my family. And I am reaping something today that is worth. There is no price. There's no price at all. So we need to move on to the next one. Just say something quick. I'm going to say something quick. There you go. <laughs> so when we were young and newly married, 
uh, we went to church one day and our pastor said, everything has a price. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. You know, even salvation has a price. And yeah. we say it's the free Jesus. gift of God, but we have to humble ourselves and receive it. And so that is a price. Well, some people won't pay that price. Some people won't humble themselves. So that price is too high. So um, when it comes to having a godly family, there is a price to pay. But what this pastor told us, he said, if you'll pay up front, it'll be cheaper. Yeah. And it's a, it's a financial principle. And it's across the board. If you pay for your house all up front, you end up paying several hundred thousand dollars less, less yeah. than if you finance it. And, and, you know, and not all of us can do that, but, but it's just a, it's a principle. Yeah. And so if we are willing to pay that price to have a godly marriage, to have an intimate, loving marriage, and to have children who have been trained in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, who respect and honor their parents, and who will grow up to love the Lord, then we, we're, we're getting it at a cheaper price. Yeah, it's it still is. hard work. It is hard work. But if you put it off to their 15 and you haven't done anything, it's still hope. Yeah. There's always hope in Jesus but you will pay a higher price. Amen. So that was very motivating for us. So we're like, we better pay up front. You know, we better, we better pay now. All right. Practical tool number four. Now, this one I love. This one, believe it or not, this one's been going on in my house for 30-something years, and it's family time. Okay, I'm sure you're probably already doing this, or, or I don't think we mentioned it last time. We probably mentioned it, but we didn't talk much about it. You need to go home and establish a night a week that is your family's family time. And this is a sacred night in your household. Uh, literally, for 30-something years, the Aldis have had a night a week that's Aldi family night. And I, my grown children today that have their own kids come over to this now. It's Monday nights. We get together as a family. I don't take other opportunities, uh, you know, and, and that, that's the thing. This and, and the beauty of family time is this is where you build your family. And, and especially, Daryl probably have, you know, some comments. I think we list some rules of family time. You know, most often when it comes to discipline or, or you know, instruction for our children, most often we think about it when they're doing wrong right? Well, family time, now you have one night a week that is just teaching or instructing in peace. There's no conflict. And so uh, the purpose of family time is, is every faceted. But often, like this is where we taught our kids how we, want, how we wanted them to behave when someone older than them walked in the room. This is where we taught them how we wanted them to behave when we went in Walmart. This is where we taught them how we wanted them to learn how to share. This is where we taught them obedience. You know, daddy said, come. And we, we would, you know, we'd put them across the room one at a time. Okay, come here, Jimmy. And I don't have a Jimmy. But anyway, Jimmy would not, I, we'd always say, let's do it the wrong way first. What does disobedience yeah, look like? Yeah, and that's disobedience. And so I'd say, come here, Jimmy. And he, he'd turn around and start Oh, this, no, you know? that's and so we'd all bad. Go, no, oh, no, no, <laughs> you don't do it like that. And I'd say, now, what does obedience look like? Who wants come, to do obedience? Yeah. Raise your hand. Oh, I want to do it. I wanna and, do and it's as simple as, again, we've got a vision. And now we've got some priorities. We're learning to take our thoughts parent, uh, captive as parents. And you need to teach your kids how to take their thoughts captive. And who likes to discipline their children? Yeah. No, yeah. I, I, I don't want to I don't want to spank my children. I don't want to discipline my children. And the more we do this kind of training, the less discipline we have to do. Yeah. Because we're teaching. They are learning something all the time. And so we specifically took one night a week for years and taught them the things we wanted them to know. We went over the Bible stories. I mean, just everything. There was, uh, you know, and it, it doesn't have to always be a training night. I actually believe it's, it's dad's job with the help of mom to discern. The Bible calls us the priest of our home. And the job of the priest in the Old Testament it was to discern the body and then minister to it. 
And so dad's in the room, mom's in the room. Get together. If Tuesday night's family night, talk during the day on Tuesday. What do you think we need? What do our kids need? And often we just, you know, everybody's just stressed. We need fun night. And so we just laughed and played games for an hour and a half before bedtime on Tuesday night. And so we got that time in. Or, oh, we, they've been doing really bad on obedience. We need another time on obedience. Or you know, whatever. But discern what your family needs and then minister to it. Now, I'll say this, and then we'll go over the rules and we need to move on. Um, to be truthful, I have met a lot of fathers that struggle with family time. And, and they've come to me and said, hey, can I be honest? I have no idea what to say. And it's real. Their father never did a family yeah, time they, with them, they so they have no idea how to do a family time. father putting that in them. And so I, uh, I'm willing, if anyone here would like it. So I, I had, like, I don't know, several uh, fathers that I email out weekly. I did it for about eight months. Just, hey, this week, here's what you're going to do in family time. Now, if you discern something different, do different. But if you're not knowing what, and I literally said, okay, get, get your family together and say this. I, I wanted it to be as easy as possible. And then after you do 10 or 20 of them, you'll get the hang, you'll of, get it. The hang of it and won't need those emails anymore. But it's that serious. It's that practical. Go home and establish your family's family night. And turn down jobs for it. I mean, sometimes you can't. Like, sometimes one time as an engineer, I couldn't. I couldn't miss. So I just took my family with me for family night. I mean, family night is sacred. Well, even as a pastor, people will call and need him, and it may fall on a Thursday night or a Monday night, whatever night we're doing family night at the time, and he will call someone else in our church to go take care of that need. But what that does is it denotes value to your children. Yeah, they're going to be thankful. Your children see you not watching the football game, not picking up your phone, not taking that obligation and saying, no, I'm with my family tonight. And all of a sudden they're like, wow, I'm important yeah. to my dad and to my mom. Yeah. So we just four quick rules on family time. No one, not even dad for work, if possible, can miss family time. You just cannot miss family time. Uh, Dad, you be the vision bearer, that, that cheerleader and, and present at family times. You know, I, and you know what? Yes, there are times you're going to have to miss. But we just want to be known for, for safeguarding this family time. Be consistent. Don't do it one week and say you're going to do it every week. And then you miss three weeks. And then you try to do it again. Well, then the Monday night didn't work because we forgot we did family time. So we planned something else on family night. So we got to move it to Tuesday night, and the next week, well, is it Monday night or Tuesday night, and it's Wednesday, and we forgot if we even did it. Your children will lose trust in yeah, you. Yeah, it, You will, it will not be keeping your word. It will them to lose trust. So set it on the calendar. Get your iPhone out. Put it in iCal. Tell it to repeat for forever and be there. I, I literally did that. So anyway, uh, when in family time, the focus is on the family. Do not allow a cell, cell phone or something like that to distract you. And then this one, we just say, engage and attune to your family. Uh, I'll tell you our most favorite, and then we'll run out of time. Um, our most favorite, so we had seven <laughs> kids and two adults. So we put mom on that side of the room and me on this side of the room. We put a kid in front of me, a kid in front of her. And then three kids here, no, two kids here and two kids, no, three kids here. Mm -hmm. And we got a timer out. And our kids, if you ask them today, they will say this to this day. They're 30-something years old. What was your favorite they family love, time? We got a timer, five minutes. The timer stopped, and they just got one-on-one -on -one time. So rotated. how was your day? And when the timer goes off, they rotated like a clock to the next position. So you just, you, you were anticipating getting to talk to mom. Got to talk to mom. Then you're anticipating getting to talk to dad. So that's family And you're time. like waiting your turn and you're watching yeah. brother get his back scratched. And, you know, and you're trying to speak their love language yeah. when you do that. Like this one loves eye to eye contact. This one loves having their back scratched. You know, you're, so you're trying your best just to meet them where they are at that yeah. time. But that was our favorite, our kids' favorite family time. And I just thought, and that's a desperate mom and dad there. Like, yeah. they're, they're thinking, I'm just not getting enough one-on-one -on -one time with my kids. We're just going to rotate them through like a clock and try to get at least five minutes with them. Just. It was awesome. It was. <laughs> so we'll, we'll go over the last two here pretty quick. 
practical tool. So that, that was four. Number five, and this one doesn't seem so practical, but, but I'm, giving you, I'm going to give you a prayer to pray. Engage your heart with your children. Oh, we get, this one's hard. And I'm going to be honest, most men that I know, this one's hard. It was very hard for me. So, so here's the prayer for all of us. Uh, to give our hearts, and we're, we're operating out of Malachi 4, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. I'm going to send Elijah in the last days before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the father. And that's what we're encouraging you to do. Let our hearts actually turn because your children want you to own their heart. They want you to. But we just often miss how to get it. So I can't tell you the miracle way to get it or this five-step method, but I can tell you the Lord answers prayers. And here is my prayer. Lord, I'm a dad, and I truly probably am not in touch with my own heart and emotions. I can come in and fix things and get everybody in order and be logical and tell everybody how to line up for supper or do this or do that. But that's not what my kids need. That, it's not what my wife needs. She needs my heart. Okay, so this one will go for you a long way in your marriage and in parenting. So just begin to ask in your quiet time, Lord, would you show me, would you put me in touch with my own heart and emotions? And then as you begin to feel things or hear things from the Lord, just share them with your wife, share them with your children, and then do the exact same. Ask them what's in your heart. Ask your kids all the time. If, if me and any of my children in the truck, they know what's fixing me, I'm going to say, so what's in your heart today? And they're like, oh, I hadn't thought about it. But they all of a sudden, they start to think, and all of a sudden, they say a little bit, and then a lot of bit, and then a whole lot of bit, and then I'm like, Is you, you know, can we cut the radio on for me? I'm joking. But they will share it. They're longing to give it to you, so seek it. We better move on to the last one. Well, can I just say one yeah, thing? Yeah, say one thing. A lot of times kids will give their hearts to their youth pastor or their teacher or their peers because they take the time to listen and they act like they really care. Yeah. And sometimes as parents, we forget to stop and, and value yeah. our children's hearts and how they're feeling. Yeah. So, Practical tool number six, you're going to really like enjoy your children. Man, we need to hear that, unfortunately. Sometimes we get just so caught up and we got to do this perfect and this has got to be perfect and this is and 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 boy they they're kind of restricting my life here. And so just as a practical idea, we just wanted to encourage you as parents just take the time to enjoy your children. They are a gift from the Lord. And I want to say this about enjoyment and I I I've got testimonies of this and I'm sure you do too. I enjoy whatever I choose to enjoy. We think it's like this fuzzy, and I have these fuzzies for my kids, and you do too. But sometimes when they've been, you know, misbehaving, and again, all the pressures that are on us, we forget to enjoy our children. And so sometimes it's been a real bad day or a real bad week or all these things. And enjoyment, I believe, is a choice. And there are things in my life right now that if you, if the Lord walked in the room and said, Dennis, do you really like it? I'd probably say, well, I'd really prefer it if you'd change that. But I've chosen to enjoy it. And our kids aren't in that category. I mean, they're not these things that we have to make ourselves enjoy, but we do have to take the time to think about it and do it. And so we just wanted to encourage you with that. Is there another one here? Well, and I want to say sometimes parents, as we're training our kids, if you're taking that, that mandate seriously, we can get so distracted by their behavior and whether or not they're obeying or disobeying or whatever that we, we, for, we literally forget to enjoy them. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus enjoys us at every stage of maturity. And so yeah. we just need to enjoy them at every yeah. stage of maturity and so amen yeah. well it's getting kind of the end so i think that's really all we'll take so you can see the clock there i don't know how much if if there's time for question and answer we had a couple that were given to us so you what would you like us to do at this point well that's good oh my gosh so so good um 
Yeah, we want to honor your, your time and the ones who are doing child care right now. However, uh, we would love, uh, we, we were saying submit the questions, but um, I would love Q&A right now. And so if you guys have a question, we'll pass the mic. And then if you guys could answer it, sure. and we'll try to go for about five minutes. Um, so it, anybody got a question? Yeah. Uh, uh, the rules, uh, uh, tool number five was the um, uh, engage, capture the hearts of your children. And that's practically through a prayer where you're saying, Lord, let me know my heart so I can give that heart. Because we're, you know, Malachi, we're giving our hearts to our children. That's what they want. And they, they were created to give us their hearts. So that's five. Six was enjoy your children. Does anyone else have a question? I'm going to come to you, Jeff. Um, mine is about parenting children differently. We have two very different children. They couldn't be more opposite from one end of the spectrum to the other. And so we find, well, I guess I speak for myself, but I find it challenging to navigate the dichotomy of both personalities and having to switch when one sees one being corrected one way and the other sees the other one being corrected a different way. And then um, growing up for me, we were all parented and corrected the same way. And so here we are trying to navigate differently, break different um, continuation of parenting styles and yeah. that type of thing. And so I'm having a hard time uh, pivoting from one end to the other and saying yes it's fair because one needs one and the other doesn't and yeah. that kind of thing well i i just want to say first that we a lot of times sometimes sometimes when we have different kind of children we'll change the standard and so we want to just establish yes. that we we keep the standard the same even though we may approach our children differently and and really the way that we discipline our children is based on effectiveness. And um, so uh, is it just a lot for you to think about, like trying to keep track of what you're doing with the other? Or is it more that the children are, are resentful that this one is trained this way and this one is trained that way? We have a challenger. Oh. Okay. We, we have a want to go toe to toe. One, one of them wants to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the adults, and the, mm -hmm. the other one just doesn't want you to breathe too loudly. She'll do what you ask her to do, and the other wants to challenge in every sense of the word. Yes. Well, we had a challenger, a, a defiant firstborn challenger, and then we had one that where the threshold in the kitchen was here, and we had told them to stay on this side of the threshold. They would go... You know, and, and really the defiant child is easier to train because it's very obvious that they're being disrespectful, but you want to work with that child. Uh, and, and basically in our home, we didn't allow Challenge. challenges. <laughs> kind of sounds harsh, but we, we gave them tools to use if, if they wanted, uh, well, one was just called making an appeal, which sounds really grown up. But we taught our children to make appeals if they needed to give us more information. But they, but but they had to be characterized by first-time obedience before they were given the privilege of making an appeal to us if, if they needed to make an appeal. But we would separate the child that's throwing the fit and isolate them somewhere because a fit needs an audience. The, 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 the fit needs an audience to be effective. And if you take away the audience, there's not that much motivation to keep throwing the fit. And so we would just deposit them in a crib or in their room and tell them to stay until they had more self-control. And we taught, we taught them, there's something about doing this. I don't know, but this is called self-control hands. And when a child started losing it, we would just say, get your self-control hands and I would just pray for them to have self-control if they persisted I would just separate them from us and um, but it's the passive 
the passive rebellion child that you got to watch out for. <laughs> I'm going to just say one thing. Um, I just forgot it. So let's go for another question. Anyone else? Carrie, get Charity on, get you here. Um, what are some practical family night ideas? Oh, wow. um, because yeah. I, you've had seven kids. I only have two, and there's just the three of us in the home. But we're all so different from each other. What we like, what we don't like. What are some practical things that any family with any amount of people in the family can, and they're all so different, can say, we can get together on family night and do these things? Or how do you find those things without yeah. someone resisting and mm -hmm. ruining the atmosphere? Well, so to have family night, there's a couple of things you're going to have to establish in your home, and that is none of us are here for ourselves. Uh, so what a family is, is it is the ultimate godly team. And everybody, if you've ever been involved in sports, if, if there's a basketball team, a football team, any, if any one person decides my rights are bigger than the team's rights, the team falls apart. And our families are like that as well. At any moment that we allow dad or mom, or, or Jimmy, Johnny, and Joe Ellen, any of those that their personal giftings, preferences. preferences, are more important than the families, you won't be able to have family time because they'll just show up and say, I don't like this, I'm out of here. So, so we never allowed that in our house. We, we taught from the very young. We're the Aldi team. I used to make them all turn around. I'd say, what's that written on the back of your shirt? You know, when you get on a team, it's got your name. And it, Aldi, 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 Aldi. We're the Aldi team. And every one of us have to serve the team or the team fails. And I, So family night number one is a huge talk on team and sports. And do they play sports? I don't know your ages, you know. And, and what would it be like if the best player on the team got there and said, I ain't practicing today, y'all practice. Would he still be, he shouldn't be on the team. The coach should get rid of him. I'm not telling you to get rid of your child, that's impossible. <laughs> but I'm saying, no, he has to come under the vision of the team. That's why we're writing a vision so that family night number one, after you've written your vision, is sharing the vision with your family. And talking about what is, how does this motivate us as a family? And if you, if 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 at this point, excuse me, they they feel they have the right to not engage, I would just begin to tell them that's not allowed. And and if it it needed to be some kind of a discipline, or they just sat there angry for a little while, I would make them do it personally because they they need to, because that's again culture saying it's all about me. The Bible says it's all about what I lose. And one another. And one another, what I serve one another, love one another. And so if you have four people in your family, you would say, okay, what's your favorite, your favorite, your favorite, and your favorite? Okay. So about every four times, we may get to do your favorite. We might get to do your favorite. But tonight we're going to do this, and we're all going to enjoy it. We're going to do it with happy hearts because we're together, and we're each other's best friends. And this is the best family in the world. we got to quit, so I'll say this. So I did this with my church, and I'm, I'm just wanting to bless your pastor right here. You ought to do this. You know, I, I, I don't know if any of y'all have ever been a pastor, but you get to hear a lot of people's opinions. <laughs> about how to make the church better. You know what I'm saying? And we love it, kind of. It's one of those choosing joy things, you know? So I told our church, I said, look, here's the deal. We got 100 people in the room. There's going Every 100th time it might go your way because it's about the family, not you. It's not about you. Nowhere in the Bible does it say it's about you. It, it, Christ didn't consider equality with God to be something grass, but he emptied himself and became a human, a servant at that. And that's what we want to teach our kids. Yeah, we'll do one last one. Um, I don't know if you've experienced this too, but for me, motherhood is such a sanctifying experience. The Lord is so good to show me sometimes through my children, my own shortcomings, 
and he's gracious enough to forgive me of them. But one he's shown me is that I have one child that's similarly stubborn, and I want to know how can I engage their heart the way the Father does mine in order to submit to that and let go of that stubbornness. Like you said, for the betterment of the team too, less of self and more of him, how can I engage their heart to get to that understanding? And this one's a little bit older, so I think the conversation would happen, could happen, and that understanding could happen for this one. (laughs) While Dara comes up with a great answer, I'm going to say, I cannot tell you how many times the Lord has answered my prayers on those things. All of these issues, I have, Lord, I have no idea how to capture their heart on this. You have got to tell me, show me, give me an opportunity. I'm clueless. Help me. Speak to me. Open their heart. Turn their heart. Turn And, and literally, I can't tell you how many times he has. So one of the things the Lord has shown us is if you can figure out what their love language is, when a child feels loved, their heart unlocks. And I remember feeling like we were losing one of our older sons. It was just some distance. And I remember the Holy Spirit just saying, every time you walk through the room, touch him. Come up behind him, rub his shoulders. If you're standing by him, stick your arm through his arm, hold his hand. Uh, If, you know, put your hand on his shoulder, if you're, just touch him, touch him, touch him, touch him. And his heart unlocked and he, he opened his heart to me. So I think speaking their love language and then I, I believe compassion. I don't feel like we need to lower the standard of obedience, but we can always show compassion. It was the compassionate high priest of Jesus that unlocked my religious heart and made me just like mush, you know? And so when we, sh- it's, it's the youth pastors and the peers that show compassion and, and the parents are the heavy. And so we need to learn not to lower our standard and not to compromise, but to show compassion to our children. Yeah, and family time can be a night of compassion just where we sit and listen, literally. I have a mom I met with this morning. She has a 15-year-old whose heart is really, really hard. And she's uh, doing a Bible study with him. And she made him a cobbler. And he... That would work for me. (laughs) She made him a cobbler. And they studied the Bible while he ate cobbler. And he opened up more than he ever had before. And she went, I think... This is a key. And so she is going to cook a little something special for him each time they sit down and study the Bible because it was something the Lord was using to unlock his heart. So just ask the Lord for creative ways to touch your child's heart. And then lastly, children open their hearts at nighttime when they're going to bed. If you can sit on the edge of their bed and just rub their back, how, how was your day today? They, they will just start pouring at bedtime. But we're always like, go to bed. Do not get out of the bed. Brush your teeth. Get your pajamas on. You know, and you're no, it's like this. We got to accomplish it. But if just every once in a while, if you could just sit on the edge of the bed and just say, Lord, if there's a crack in the window of their heart, would you just let them open their heart to me and just be available? Just be available. Thank you. Good. That's good. Man, that last point was a mic drop moment right there at night. Um, Thank you, guys. Can we just give them a hand, everyone? Wow.